All right. Good morning, everyone. This is the Head Start Support Services Mental Health RFP. My name is B. Nichols, and my colleague, Maggie Graham. Did you want to introduce yourself, Maggie? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Maggie. I am a principal operations analyst for the department. And a little later, I'll be going through some of the more technical aspects of how to get it, your application in on time. So, and if you haven't done it before, or if you need a little refresher. So thanks for being here. Thanks, Maggie. All right. We're going to jump into the webinar. Next slide. All right, so just a little housekeeping. Uh, we have a lot of participants, so everyone is on mute, but you can submit questions in the question box and we'll respond to those as we go through. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll also ask if there are any other questions. If you are experiencing any technical issues, please put it in the question box and we are recording this webinar. Next slide. This is the agenda. So we've just done welcome and introductions. I'll go over purpose and background program description. We'll go over selection criteria, the timeline for submission. And then as Maggie mentioned, she'll walk you through e-procurement and then we'll take any questions. Next slide. All right, so the purpose of this particular RFP is that we are seeking an entity to provide subject matter expertise, training, and technical assistance to DFSS and our Chicago Early Learning direct service providers in subjects related to early childhood mental health as a support, as a support services delegate agency. Direct service, uh, delegate agencies with Head Start funding. So those are all of the Head Start grants that the department has are required to ensure infants, toddlers, and preschoolers have access to mental health services. And I'll also add staff. Next slide. All right, the background for this. We have been able to strengthen our mental health services and systems uh, including policies and procedures that ensure mental health systems uh, are provided by uh, using the Head Start pro program performance standards, that those compliance standards are met both across our network of direct service uh, delegate agency and sites, as well as with the FSS. At any individual agencies and sites that fail to meet uh, Chicago um, Children's Services Division Mental Health Related Monitoring Performance Standards and Measures. And we've developed innovative and effective practices for improving children's mental health and wellness at the grassroots level that can be delivered through a direct service, delegate agencies daily or ongoing practices and to improve social emotional outcomes for low-income children and their families. Next slide. The goals. Support service delegate agencies have specialized knowledge, expertise, and credentials that support uh, Chicago Early Learning direct service delegate agencies and their management must support cell programs with compliance to fund the requirements. A little later, you'll see all of the funders that we report to and some of the links that you can access. The FSS CSD uses support service delegate agencies to ensure that cell programs and their management meet three broad objectives. Implementation of best practices in the early childhood development, education, and related fields, compliance, with relevant federal, state, and local performance standards and requirements and improved outcomes for young children and their families. Next slide. The requirements. Mental health services support service delegate agencies 
will be required to develop and deliver training sessions, provide technical assistance and consultation in the area of mental health to DFSS and its direct delegate agencies and ensure that DFSS and its delegate agencies meet the mental health requirements listed in the RFP. We intend to contract with one entity to provide services citywide that can meet the following required qualifications and conduct and conduct the following required activities. Provide guidance on subject related policies and procedures, development of those policies and procedures and um, memorandum related to best practices, subject area research, program requirements and standards. The support service delegate agency will be expected to review and provide updates assist in the development of policies, procedures, memorandum, at least annually. Mental health services must be trauma-informed and grounded in evidence-based research. Consult with the FSS to provide clarity on program components, service expectations, requirements, and standards. Advise DFSS and its direct service agencies on current and new mental health issues and practices as they arise, especially as they relate to cell service population and its well-being, cell program requirements and standards. Act as the co-chair of the Quarterly Health Services Advisory Committee and co-chair the Health Subcommittee. Next slide. This is the full understanding of cell program uh, standards related to mental health from each of our funders. So you have federal and state and best practices. Next slide. Performance goals and outcomes. This, this particular mental health services support service delegate agency is required to develop and deliver training, provide technical assistance and consultation in the area of mental health services to DFSS and its direct services agencies in order to improve direct service performance and compliance with the various standards, such as performance outcomes. They will be assessed in the following manner by following all of the performance requirements that I just shared in the previous slide, as well as receiving intensive TNTA, as well as any pre and post service surveys uh, that assess the impact of training on attendees' knowledge. Next slide. In order to monitor and recognize intermediate uh, progress towards these performance indicators, DFSS also intends to track output metrics that may include, but are not limited to, the number of trainings that are provided the number of intensive TNTA hours to DFSS, direct service agencies, number of completed direct service agency training plans, corrective action plans, or quality improvement plans, number of hours provided to, to the health services as advisory committee and subcommittees, number of parent trainings that are conducted, materials that are developed for parent education, and number of delegate and partner agency observations and consultations conducted, number of individual child and pregnant mom plans that are supported. In addition to the above mentioned performance indicators and output metrics, the FSS encourages applicants to propose additional indicators and metrics, including those that demonstrate early success and are indicative a participant's progress. Next slide. These are the selection criteria that we will be using. Community investment and responsiveness. We'll be looking at the applicants, um, how the, you demonstrate a clear understanding of the target population, including strengths and assets, needs and challenges. How you demonstrate clients and community engagement activities 
that informed service delivery, your expertise in working with the target population, relevant competencies and capabilities, and or infrastructure or capacity to serve, a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Leadership reflects and engages the diversity of people in the communities that it serves. Next slide. Organizational capacity. Do you have the qualified staff responsible for program oversight and management? Do you have adequate systems and processes to support monitoring program expenditures and fiscal controls? Do you have an adequate human resources capacity to hire and manage staff? Next slide. Strength of your proposed program. Do you have clearly defined services that will be provided either directly or through partnerships, linkage agreements with other agencies or subrecipients that are appropriate to addressing the needs of and achieving desired outcomes for the part for the target population? What is your proposed program? Does it support by national, strong, or evidence-based and or aligns with best practices for the relevant field? Do you have an effective approach to identifying and retaining program participants, including the rules and regulations that reduce barriers to participation? Do you have partnerships or coordinate with other agencies to expand or improve upon services in a client-centered, comprehensive way. Next slide. Performance management and outcomes. Can you demonstrate evidence of strong past performance against desired goals and performance metrics or other notable accomplishments in providing services to the target population? Have you used your experience when using data to inform and approvable services or practices? Do you have relevant systems and processes needed to collect and store key participant and performance data? Next slide. Reasonable costs, budget, justification, and leverage of funds. Do you have the fiscal, fiscal capacity to implement the proposed program? Do you leverage other funds and in-kind contributions to support total program and administrative costs. For example, state, federal, foundation, corporate, or individual donations. Can you demonstrate reasonable implementation costs and funding requests relative to your financial and human resources? The proposed budget must support the proposed scope of work or work plan. Next slide. And then you can upload any attachments. Be sure to attach reports, studies, or other relevant documentation to show performance towards reaching program goals and demonstration of results and accomplishments. Be sure to attach the resumes for your key staff that are overseeing the program and attach your budgets your organization's budget for the proposed program. Next slide. Selection and transition timeline. Today we are doing the pre-proposal webinar. We expect applications to be submitted on or by October the 9th, 2023 at noon. Again, next slide. We're reminding you that the applications are due on October the 9th, by noon, proposals must be submitted via online application. Emailed or faxed proposals will not be accepted. And now I'm turning it over to Maggie. Great, thanks, B. So we don't have any questions in the Q&A box right now, but that's okay because we will have another time to ask questions at the end of this. So, so don't worry if you're still working on something you're trying to ask. So I'm gonna just go through some of the technical aspects of this, of, of turning in 
your application and accepting an amendment and going over the resources that you can turn to if you're having trouble with the e-procurement system. So to start, you can get these resources to like if you're in the middle of submitting your application or you're, or you're setting up your account and you need to to look at training materials or you have a specific question about e-procurement these are the resources you can reach out to the this email address for registering or for having issues you you come across in the e-procurement system there's also some documents and videos about how to use that system if you want to check out those before you get started if if you're worried about setting yourself up but you can always come back to this webinar and come back to these slides and get these resources if you need them so just a few tips for to reach your best level of success for turning in your application we always recommend that you start early and save often if you've never done business with the city before you have to register in iSupply or an e-procurement and that can take a while to get that all set up so we recommend that you start that as early as possible so you're not running up against the clock too much when you're answering the questions in in the application remember that the to review the rfp narrative and application questions closely because those are the they align with the scope and selection criteria very closely. So you can use that information for guidance when you're formulating your answers. In the e-procurement system, there's a 4,000 character limit, including punctuation and spaces. But the thing is, it won't tell you when you're reaching that number. There isn't a counter on, inside of the, the word processing in there. So we always recommend that you're writing in a separate Word document or something so that you can keep track of your character use because e-procurement will just cut you off and not tell you. So we want to make sure that you're being able to say everything you want to say, but keeping that 4,000 character limit in mind. And then another good tip is when you're inside of e-procurement, you can't use the back button on your browser because it will lose everything that you did. It won't save. It will, it will break it. And that has personally messed me up several times. So just make sure you're saving a lot and not using the back button. You have to use like the the go back to home and go back to the use the tabs and not the browser buttons, if that makes sense. So just read it what read it, reiterate it one more time. We need your application in by October 9th at noon. You can submit your application way before that and continue to go in and edit your application, but the reason we stress the noon part so much is because it can take a, like half an hour to an hour to actually turn in the application with error messages that pop up, computers taking a long time, uh, unanticipated issues that come up. So we recommend that you you start even the day before the ninth, like the, the eighth, to make sure that you're really making sure that you have plenty of time and you don't run up against any issues because we can't take any late applications, it's not an issue even of us being strict about it. Like we cannot access the applications if we want to in the system. So we just want to be really clear about that. There is a hotline again for e-procurement issues. It's this 312-744-4357 number, but just like a quick note, that's only operating Monday through Friday, nine to five. So if you're, the whole point of this is just to say again, let's get started on this early so that if issues arise, because it can be kind of a finicky system. So if issues arise, you have plenty of time to get those worked out. And if you're a new agency, you haven't worked with the city before, there are a few things that you're going to need ready to go. Your articles of incorporation and any amended articles of incorporation, your IRS affirmation letter, your DUNS number, your central contractor registration, and your certificate of good standing letter with the state of Illinois. This is all information that's included in the RFP itself. So you'll be able to review this. And then again, this webinar itself is being recorded. So you'll be and will be sent out so you can and rewatch this as well if this is if this is you know you want to get back to these details so again here is the links for those resources for technical assistance for e-procurement and the number you can call and the email that you can reach out to if you're having issues so the next thing we're going to go through really quickly is how to accept an amendment within the e-procurement system 
So we will attach an amendment to an RFP when we are changing something, like say we move the due date to be a little bit later, or after this webinar, if, if people have questions, if people send questions into B and we want to make sure that everybody has the same information available to them, we'll add an amendment to the RFP just to make sure that everyone's got the same info. But in order for things to be fair, we need to make sure that everyone, every applicant is acknowledging that they have seen the amendments. So I'm going to make sure that everyone knows how to do that now. So if you have already started your RFP application for this, you're going to go into the procurement system and you're going to see this little thing over here that says view amendment history and then you'll be able to click on that and start the acceptance process if you aren't seeing this view amendment history yet we haven't added it and you're just starting your application already the way that you begin is you go over to this actions part you go to you click the drop down menu you pick create quote and then you pick go and that's when you'll be able to start your application. If you start your application before we add an amendment, the next time you log in to e-procurement after we've added it, it'll it'll show you this and everything you've done thus that far will get carried over to the amended version. So you don't have to redo anything. So back to the amendment accepting process, you're going to click view amendment history and then it's going to take you to this screen to look at the RFP itself, like to look at the amended RFP, you click by the number one over here, you click this small document number and it's this point one is indicating that it's been amended. So you can look at it there. You can look at the changes themselves over by the number two over here by this little, click this little glasses icon. And then you can look at the changes that the amendment is adding specifically. And then once you've done all that, you can click acknowledge amendment to show that you've read it, you feel good about it, you're ready to accept it. So then once you've clicked Acknowledge Amendment, it's going to take you to this screen. You're going to click that you've accepted that the changes and that you've seen them. Hit go back over here, hit Acknowledge again. And then that's going to take you to this confirmation screen. You're going to click yes again. You've confirmed that you've seen it, which will take you to this page where you have to again check that you have accepted the terms and conditions of the amendment. You've seen it for the millionth time. You click accept again. You have to check this box before you hit accept or it won't go through just as a quick tip. And then so that after you've done that, you've accepted the amendment, you're ready to go. Like I said, any work that you've already done in your application will be moved over to the amended version so then you're ready to keep working so now we'll get into how to actually submit your application you've accepted the amendment you've done all your stuff you've added all your attachments you're ready to go so first you're going to save your draft like you are going to do every time you do anything that's what i do in here because i don't the system is like I said, a little finicky. So I, I truly do save every time I do anything in here. So that's just how you might want to operate. So you're going to click save and then you're going to click continue. And then a lot, most of the time, honestly, you're going to get a couple of error messages up here before it's going to let you actually submit. So we're going to go through the most common ones of those to make sure that you know how to handle them when they come up. And again, this is this is partially why it can take a little bit to actually submit when you're done with your application. So but we're going to do our best to make it be as easy as possible. So a very common error that pops up is this. The RFQ control requires you to quote on all lines. So what that means is it's referring to this lines tab right here. And so what you do is you go to the little lines tab and in there, it's got the same questions as what you've submitted in your budget attachment. So you can put that information in there. We build it out for the contracting process. It's not really a part of the application process itself, but the system needs there to be information in each of those lines. So you can put the budget information in there and then it'll, it'll, check it off its list, but that's not necessarily something that we, we're, we're looking at your budget attachment is the main thing you need to know. But in order for the system to accept the application, these lines need to be filled out. So the next most common 
error that people get is a quote value is required for requirement first name. So what this means is the requirement is what e-procurement calls the application questions. This first name right here is like the name of the question. So the end quote value is the answer. So really all it's saying is you didn't answer the question first name. You left it blank. So you just go down to your requirements. You go, you find the question you haven't answered. You fill that in. You'll be ready to go. So then once you've fixed all the errors and you click save and continue again, you're going to get you're going to get to this new stage of review and submit, which is great. So now you're actually getting ready to submit it. So you're going to click submit over here and then that's going to take you to the full review of what you your whole application this is your last chance to review everything that you've put in all your attachments that you feel good about everything you've submitted and then you're going to go to the bottom of the screen and then you're going to electronically sign saying that everything in there is what you want to be in there and a quick thing is you have to put your signature in before you click this little box saying that you've everything that in, is in there is true and real and i know that it's confusing because the box is on top of the e-signature part but you have to do the e-signature part first or it won't work so then you go over to the other part of the screen at the bottom and click submit and then you'll be brought to this confirmation screen you'll set you get a confirmation email within 24 hours to the email you use to set up your e-procurement system check the spam folder if you're if you haven't seen it within a day because sometimes it can head in there but otherwise we can confirm from our end if you really if you need us to that we have received it so yeah that's all of the e-procurement stuff again you'll be able to look at this web webinar later the slides specifically later and you'll be able to look on the city website for more for documents and training videos about how to go through this it's it's not as horrible as it seems but it can be a little a little finicky so if there aren't any questions then and again you can reach out to b or me to like if if you have programmatic questions you can reach out to b for non-programmatic technical questions you can reach out to me anytime so yeah that's was all the information we had for you today b i'll throw it back to you to to close out all right well thank you maggie Thanks everyone for participating. You have our email addresses on screen and feel free to contact us. Thank you for joining today. Thanks Goodbye. everyone.